Jeremiah 31. Turn there, please. Jeremiah 31. By the way, I, I told this Wednesday night, but for those of you who didn't hear it, one of my, one of my favorite stories, I um, was at the AT&T store Monday up in Fenton and was getting my phone looked at, brand new phone, getting it looked at. And a man walked in, older man, and he had a, one of those military caps on, so I thought, well, I'm going to get him. Before I walk out of here, if he's still here, I'm going to get him. So I walked over to him when I got done. I stuck my hand out. And he sat there and he stuck his hand out. I said, sir, I just want to tell you thank you for serving and honoring your country. God bless you for that. He smiled. And he said, and it wasn't, I mean, he's preaching. It was an honor to serve my country. I went, hey, I like you. And he said, I stand for my country and I stand for my flag and if you don't like it, you can go back to the nation of your ancestors. I want to do cartwheels in that store. I tell you, guys like that, we're losing them. We're losing that. And I don't know what it'll take to get a generation that still loves liberty. And realizes the price that's paid for it. I don't know. Maybe we'll have to fight another war. I don't know. But I like guys like that. I pray for them. I pray that they all get saved. Every one of them. Amen. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. That's what our, that's what our best men did. Jeremiah 31. We're talking about the new covenant. Here is the prophetic basis for it. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. I have it up on the screen. I want you to open your Bibles up to that. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband to them, Saith the Lord, and he's talking about the Ten Commandments, the Mount Sinai Covenant. Where God brought Israel toward the base of Mount Sinai. He sent Moses down. It's a type, it's a typology of Jesus coming down from heaven. God sent his son down with a new covenant. God sent Moses down with a covenant. And he said, here's the law of God. And the Israelites actually said, all that thou hast said, we will do. In other words, they, they agreed to the covenant. They said, we'll keep the Ten Commandments. But they didn't. It wasn't God that broke the covenant. It was man that broke the covenant. So the covenant's broken. It's of no effect anymore. So God said, back in the Old Testament, He, gave, he put a provision in here that there's going to be a new contract, a new covenant. And the contract is between God and men. And the contract says, I'll give you heaven for all eternity. And I will forgive all of your sins. And on your part, your acceptance is, I believe what God said. Amen. That's you accepting the covenant. So, here's the contract here that was agreed upon. By me and God. Don't change one word in my contract. I'm happy with how it is. Amen. Don't change it. So he said, verse 33, this shall be the covenant that I will make the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. What did David say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that's the covenant right there. When he puts his, watch this, your heart is where your, your real decisions are made. Your heart is. When you fell in love with somebody, you did it not out of your mind. You didn't analyze them and say, okay, this would be the perfect person for me to get along with. This would be the perfect person to have my children. This would be the perfect person to keep my house or the perfect person to give me a job. You did not analyze it like that. Your brain went south. And your heart made a decision that sometimes your brain said, what in the world did I do? But it was your heart. And God said, 
I'm going to put my laws in your heart. So instead of you doing what God said, because you have to, you now do them because you want to do them. And that makes it easier, doesn't it? It's like trying to get kids up to go to school or waking kids up for Christmas Day, which is easier. They get up on Christmas Day, why? Because they want to. But they don't get up easy on school day because they have to. So that's the covenant. After those days, saith the Lord, I put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And it will be their God and they shall be my people. That's the contract. That's the, that's the covenant that he made. Now, go to John chapter 14. You turn there and we'll pray. You ask God to bless the message. Help me to preach it. Appreciate all the blessing you sent our way and all the encouragement, all the prayers. By the way, I'm going to announce that Lisa and I are leaving for a week. We'll be back. We're going to go to Alaska in July for a week. We're going to go see Mount Rainier and we're going to go see icebergs. And we're going to try to see whales for a week. So that'll be July. We're leaving July 11th. So we'll be gone 11, 12, 13. July 14th is a Sunday, right? So I'll try to get a preacher here that Sunday. And if I can't, I'll pick one. Who can I pick? Who wants to preach? You know, I believe that. He's got it in him, I can tell you that right now. He's not afraid to say something, amen? You get that, Jaden, from me. That's my genetics in you. And you get it from your crazy grandma, Judy. It's where it comes from, ain't it, Trish? It's exactly where it comes from. All right, John chapter 14, let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, pray your blessings, Lord, on this service and on this message. God, this is your church, these are your people, all the people, Father, that are gathering with us in Samburu, Kenya. We pray your blessings on them, all those pastors, Lord, that have brought their people out there on a Sunday night watching our service. We pray your blessing on them. All the people, Lord, that could not be with us this morning, we pray your blessings on them. All the people watching with us who are faithful with us every Sunday, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every service. They're there watching. They're, they're churching with us. And we pray a blessing on them as well. And Father, we pray a blessing upon all of our families here. We ask you, God, to just visit with each and every one and teach us, Father. Uh, Lord, it is so easy to love you. When you wrote your laws and your word in our heart. When you did what you did for us. It was so easy to love you. Because of what you've done for us. Nobody, nobody has ever done for us what you've done for us. So Father... You're an easy God to love. Bless the message. Bless us, Lord. Help us to hear from heaven today what you have for us. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. John chapter 14, verse 15. I have it up on the screen, but I want you to look in your Bibles. I always want you to look in your Bibles. Uh, a sister blessed me this morning. I'm not going to tell you who it is because it's not a boast or anything like that. But they showed me stacks of notebooks that they've kept on everything I've ever preached. Every sermon, every Bible study, every Watchman broadcast, every Pastor Mike online. Big stack of notebooks. And it wasn't 
it, I looked at them. It wasn't full of things I said. It was full of scriptures I quoted. And different topics. And God bless that. Okay? Now, you may be able to sit there and not take notes. I have to take notes. I have to, these things, I have to remember these things. I have to go back to my notes and things like that. But uh, it just blessed my heart this morning. And I want you to take to heart the things that you're going to hear today. And I'm going to ask you a question this morning. How many sins did Jesus ever commit? None. How many commandments did he break? None. So, here's what I want you to do. As you're reading the Old Testament, you read in there all of those things that God told Israel to do. All those commandments. And then he promised, what he did, he promised blessings to them. That if they would do this, then I'll give you this. Now, understand that nobody has ever kept all of those things that God said, with the exception of Jesus Christ, and who, by the way, was of the tribes of Israel. He was, it was his forefathers that stood at the base of Mount Sinai that God made the covenant with. And God said in Deuteronomy 28, he said, I'm not making this covenant with just you here, but all the generations that follow this covenant will be in effect. So what that means is that covenant applied and was in effect to every generation of Israel until finally one showed up, a representative of the tribes of Israel who showed up and actually kept every single one of those commandments. And his name was Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Judah, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Adam, the son of God. Jesus kept his father's commandments. So what that means is, uh, hold your place there in John 14, turn over to Psalm chapter 1. I want to show you how this works. Here's the, here's the promises of the old covenant kept by God. All the Israelites failed. Only one Jew remained. Who kept those promises. And by the way. Listen to your pastor this morning. Your pastor still believes. That God is going to restore. A remnant of the tribes of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And you say. Well how can he? All those Jews broke the covenant. One didn't. One didn't. And that one has stepped forward and said. I will share my blessings with my brethren. Joseph was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, who when he was made pretty much the king over all the earth, and his own brethren were starving to death up in that land, what did Joseph do? See, the, tr the tribes came to him and they said, we're starving and we be from one man and we're from the land of, uh, of, of, I can't remember where they're from, but he said, but we're from that land and we need food. And they didn't know it was Joseph, their own brother, who was going to give it to them. And Joseph finally revealed himself. He said, it is I, Joseph, be not afraid. I've got the food. I'll share it with you. It's been given into my hands. I can, I have all the food of all of Egypt. We've been storing it up for seven years. Seven's God's number for perfection. And he told his old brothers who sold him into slavery, who would have had him killed, sold him into slavery. He told his own brothers, I'll give you everything I got. You won't have to worry about it. And by the way, go tell daddy I'm not dead. Amen. So don't give me this nonsense about, well, God's done with Israel. That's a lie. Amen. Look in Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. So I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever walked in the council of ungodly people? Raise your hand. Well, you're disqualified. No blessing for you. Blessed is the man that uh, st does not stand in the way of sinners. You ever done that one? Been there. That, you're disqualified. Who sitteth in the seat of the scornful? Disqualified. Every one of us. Disqualified. We cannot get this blessing. 
And see, you might look at that and say, well, you know, I did that for a while. I should get a blessing. Well, you broke it. See, God's rule was keep all the commandments, not just the ones that you want for a little while. Keep them all. You didn't. So, but his delight's in the law of the Lord. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you. His, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Anybody here who would be willing to stand to say, I meditate in God's law day and night nonstop. You're disqualified. You don't get this blessing. You can't. So he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. This is you. You're the ungodly, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. You are disqualified from these blessings. Christ is the only one who qualifies for this. But if you are in Christ, you now receive these blessings because Christ did what you could not do. Somebody say amen. All right, now turn back to John 14. I'm going to show you this. Because I've had it with these law keepers. Oh, see, Jesus says right here, we've got to keep the commandments. Uh, Jesus told it. And what they do is, they tell you that Jesus came to take you back to the Mount Sinai covenant. That's an abomination. Jesus came to give us a better covenant. Not the old one, the new one. So he said, watch this. John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. My command. Now watch this. Two lawgivers. One was Moses, who came down with ten commandments in his hand. Written by the hand of God. Right? What did Moses do with those two tablets? Why? They were already being broken as he came down from Mount Sinai. Because they were down there having a you-know-what in God's sight while God was giving him the law. They already broke it. Jesus is a new lawgiver who comes down with a new law. A new covenant. And the old covenant says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not have no other gods. But you. That's what the old covenant says. You've already broken that. You cannot, you cannot ever be qualified for that covenant. Ever. You've already broken it. So now Jesus comes down with a new set of commandments. But instead of ten, there's only two. So let's read it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. See, there's the Godhead right there. I, Jesus, the Father, and the comforter. That he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. Now watch this. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. So now that he is in us, and we are in him, we now can be partakers of the inheritance that God promised to Israel, because Christ is Israel. He that hath, verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved in my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Awful lot of loving going on here. Now, again, the two commandments that he came down here with are love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Number two, love thy neighbor as thyself. And here's what I'm telling you. If you love, if, you, if God has done for you what he's done for me, 
He's not hard to love. See, everybody loves Oprah Winfrey. Not John. But everybody that goes to her show and she buys them a brand new car, they love her, right? Because she bought them a brand new car. So if I said, Milton, to everybody here in this church and everybody watching online, next Sunday, show up and I will pay all your bills for the rest of your life. Will you love me? Will I be easy to love then? Okay. What if it was something worse than that? What if it was you got in trouble with the law? And a sentence was imposed on you that required the payment of which you could never come up with in your whole lifetime. And they said, if you can't pay it, we're going to put you in jail for life. And I stepped forward and said, I will pay that debt. Because my father is rich. He owns cattle on a thousand hills. I'll pay your debt. So you don't have to go to prison for the rest of your life. Nobody wants to go to prison. Nobody does. Be easy to love a guy like that, wouldn't it? And you would think that you would owe him. But you don't. He paid it because he loved you. And a guy like that would be easy to love. Wouldn't he? I find it difficult to keep Ten Commandments. I find it difficult to keep one. But when it comes to loving God, that's easy. Because what He's paid for me, you have no idea. Matthew 22, verse 35, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, watch this now, lawyer, he knows the law, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Here's your two commandments right here. We have a new lawgiver and a new law. He's not from the tribe of Levi, so that covenant does not exist. He's from a different tribe, the tribe of Judah. So now, because it's a new covenant, requires a new lawgiver because it's from a different tribe. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now watch this. Look at verse 40. On these two commandments, the verb is hang all the law and prophets. Run down the list of the Ten Commandments in your mind. First one is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. All of those commandments refer to, if you love God, you'll do those things. If you love God, you won't have somebody else in his place. By the way, if you love your wife, you won't have another woman in your bed. If you love your husband, you won't have another man in your bed. If you love your wife, you'll treat her right. If you love your husband, you'll treat him right. Amen. See, it's easy to do that. When you love somebody, you'll do it for them. You'll... Boy, I'm getting... When, when God has done that for you, it just makes it easy to love him. Now on these two... And then the, the sec, second set was... Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. I'm getting probably out of line, but thou shalt not covet. Those have to do with your neighbor. See, if you love your neighbor, if you love your next door neighbor, you will not want to be and take away his wife. Because you love that man. If you love your neighbor and his children, you won't mess with his family. You won't dump your garbage in his yard because you love that man. You wouldn't do that for all the tea in China. You wouldn't do that. That man's your neighbor. Amen. And you love him. So you won't do those things. 
That, and see, all that, all Ten Commandments hang on just two. Now look at my hands. How many fingers am I holding up here? Ten. On how many hands? Two. Y'all are good at this, math stuff. Five and five. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make it into any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Your father is God. Your mother is heaven. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Five here and five here. And he said, on these two, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. There is an illustration for every doctrine in your Bible. And there is an illustration for this one. I want you to notice what I'm doing here. I'm holding up my hands. Do you recognize this from a story in the Old Testament? Turn to Exodus 17. Now, approximately how long have I been holding my hands up? Alfie, about how long? Three minutes? Gosh, it seems like an hour. I had a teacher, Caleb, Mr. Bradley, Festus Junior High School. He was a detention monitor. Meaning, if you got detention, 30 minutes detention after school, he was the guy you had to go see. And you'd sit in his class. He's a good guy. I like Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley had a, a little contest he had. He said, I'll shorten your sentence from 30 minutes to 10. If you can hold two dictionaries out like this for 10 minutes, you got off the rest of the 20. Why are you laughing, Brian? Can you hold two mud, can you two hold two five gallon buckets of drywall joint compound at arm's length like this? I used to could for about a second. I've been holding my arms up now for what? Four minutes? And I'm telling you, I'm about to drop them. Why? My flesh is weak. Don't you ever tell me how good you are. Because I tell you, you may have been good, but for a few minutes. But our flesh just won't hold out, will it? So look in your Bible. And please hurry. Exodus 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Your Israel. Your Israel. Amalek is everything that's against you. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose this out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek tomorrow. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Who's the rod? The rod is Jesus. And I'll stand with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Why did Aaron and Hur go up there? Do you know why? It came to pass, look at verse 11. When Moses held up his hand... That Israel prevailed. Look at my hands. Look at how many fingers I have. Ten. On two hands. These are the law right here. This is the Ten Commandments. This is why God gave us this number. But Moses' hands were what? I'm telling you. And they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands. The one on one side, 
and the one on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Look here. On these two hang all the law and prophets. As long as this is lifted up, God prevails and Amalek loses. But Moses' hands were heavy, as mine are now. I carry burdens that I can't hold on to very long. And I'd really like some help. No, seriously. Thank you. There we go. Now watch this. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. As long as these hands were up, Israel won. But you can't hold them up, can you? See, you've tried to live by your own righteousness, didn't you? You said... I'll quit smoking, I'll quit drinking, I'll quit cussing, I'll quit uh, doing drugs, I'll quit chasing women. I'll, in fact, I'll quit looking at them. I won't promise you I won't look at another woman the rest of my life. That lasted for about five, ten minutes. And then it went away, didn't it? So it takes someone holding up the law so that you can prevail. You see that? What I do, I do for this church. And I get so tired. And I get so weak. And then sometimes, I even break the very commandments that I try to tell you, you have to keep. Because I can't do it by myself. And neither could any of us so on these two, look at these two guys. See, this is easy now. You guys all right? Okay, there we go. Because that's where the cross was laid. Am I right? You see it? All right, thank you guys. Matthew 11. Matthew 11, turn there. Did I make my point? On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And when, because Moses, hand, Moses is the law, right? Moses, and the law is heavy. What was the law written on? Stone. Think about it. Not only was it written on that because it couldn't be changed. It was written on that because it was heavy. And you can't carry it. You tried. I tried. I lived for church all my life and I tried being perfect all my life and I have failed every time if it wasn't for God's word holding up God's commandments I couldn't do it so Matthew 11 verse 28 No wonder I had a hard time preaching this last week. Matthew 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. That's us. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. How many holes does a yoke have in it? Take my yoke upon you. Because now you're yoked to Christ. And wherever he goes, you're going. And if he goes to the promised land, you're going with him. Because you're yoked to him. And then you see, when you carry the yoke of bondage on you because of the law, 
you, you fail. You say, I'm not going to make it to heaven. I tried. I'm not good. I can't be good. So you threw off the yoke of bondage because it was too heavy to carry. You know what you were carrying? In that other, you know, here's the yoke and there's something else there. Do you know what you were carrying? A dead man. You were dragging a dead man who couldn't do... You're thinking of a movie, aren't you? What are you thinking of? Uh, there's a movie called Weekend at Bernie's. I've never seen it, but I heard about it. And it's about these guys carrying around this dead body all weekend. Some of you have seen it. You're carrying around a dead man. The flesh is dead because of sins. Amen? We're dead in trespasses and sins. So imagine you being yoked to a dead man. How much help is he going to give you? None. You're just dragging him around. And boy, does it stink. So here comes Christ, who is the Son of the living God. And he says, take my yoke and put it on you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I was about to drop my hands until I had Aaron and her come up here. And boy, did that become easy all of a sudden. Amen. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Somebody say amen. Now turn to John 15. I'm going to let you out. The quicker you turn there, the quicker you can get out of here. Get to the restaurant or wherever you're going. Or come to the altar or whatever you're going to do. John 15. Here it is in black and white or red. John 15 verse 7. John 15 is, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Right? Now, who's bearing who? John, you're a vineyard man. Do the grapes carry the vine? Vine carries the grapes. You see that now? Your yoke is easy. And if you're finding that your yoke is too hard, you've got the wrong yoke. You're yoked to something that you're dragging, not something that's carrying you. So John 15, verse 7, he said, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Boy, I sound like Jimmy Baker just now, don't I? Oh, ask. Oh, you just ask whatever you want. God will have to give it to you. You can have a new car. You can have a million dollars. You can have three jets. That's not what he means. Because I know that if you put God's word in you, you won't ask for a jet. Because your heart will be right. And you'll just be asking for what God's going to give you anyway. Amen. It's just like my grandkids coming up asking me for candy. They know I'm going to give it to them. Right, Jaden? Whoops. See, it's easy to ask for what you know you're already going to get. So now watch this. Here in his my, verse 8, Here it is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Not produce fruit. You cannot produce fruit. You bear fruit. Jesus produces the fruit. See, isn't that easy? As the, watch this. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Now watch verse 10. Here it is right here. Here's the new covenant. If you keep my commandments. How many were there? Two. Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. How many of those were there? He kept those. So He's already fulfilled the requirements of God through the law. So now, if you will keep just two. Love God. And love your neighbor. And isn't that easy? Now, just stop for a minute and listen to me. 
Loving God may be easy because God's never done us wrong. But listen to me. What about loving your neighbor when your neighbor's done you wrong? That one's hard. Unless Christ does it in you. Because who died for your neighbor? Who died for your wicked, evil, hell-deserving, pot-smoking, whiskey-drinking, fornicating neighbor? Who died for them? Jesus. He's in you, so now it's easier. And if he's not in you, you can't do it. Can't do it, can you, Lynn? But God has helped you. I don't even know what you got in mind, but I'm telling you, God has helped you love somebody that has done you wrong. Don't say it. But God has done it, has He not? See how easy that is? You can't do it in your flesh. But you can do it when you're on the vine. And when you're yoked to Christ. Because who He loves, you're going to love. Who He died and sacrificed for, you'll sacrifice for them. We got guys over fighting overseas right now, facing an enemy, so that sodomites can walk naked through our streets and burn a flag and carry that queer flag around. We got guys over there dying for people who despise the people that are over there dying. You know why they do it? They love their country. Right and wrong, they love their country.